To continue our brief series on driven modal versus driven terminal solutions, we'll be taking a look at a waveguide. Now what I've drawn is a box in HFSS, and this ends up being a hollow metallic rectangular waveguide because the background of an HFSS project is inherently PEC, so all of the walls of this rectangle have inherited a perfect electrical conducting boundary. You'll see here that I've chosen to launch my fields at these two ends of the waveguide. And this project really makes sense to look at because one of the primary differences we discussed in the last video is that a driven modal solution actually analyzes the problem in terms of incident and reflected waveguide modes. So if we select the port that I created at one extent, you'll see that I've set the simulation to compute five modes total, and I haven't drawn any integration lines. So this project is already fully solved. And we could start by looking at the insertion loss of, say, one of the modes. You'll see, of course, that it looks like it's very lossy up to a particular frequency, after which it seems to propagate just fine through our structure. And what we've done with this is identified the cutoff frequency of the first mode of propagation, which is its dominant mode. I can likewise look at the propagation constant. And here I've plotted both the real and imaginary part of our propagation constant, which is the attenuation constant and the phase constant of our transmission line. And you'll see we're really seeing the same information. Here it's indicating that that particular mode is heavily attenuated until a particular frequency in which the attenuation drops off. Likewise, we can see where the cutoff frequency is when the phase constant goes from zero to non-zero. So often when I've created a port at a particular cross section or I'm analyzing waveguides, I can tell exactly where the cutoff frequencies are for each one of those modes by plotting the propagation constant as I'm showing you here. And by default, I'll tend to choose to plot the imaginary part just because that comes up by default. So you'll see here that it looks like we're only plotting three modes, but those a little more savvy in waveguide design, particularly rectangular ones, probably know that there are a few degenerate modes present. So if I scroll over each of these traces, we'll see that the dominant mode has a cutoff around 2.5 gigahertz. The second mode and the third mode exactly coincide, and the fourth and fifth mode also coincide. This plot gives us a good idea of exactly what frequency range we might want to operate this waveguide in. Now let's take a look at the port field display. You'll see if I expand that, we could look at the field patterns for each of our modes. If we select one, we'll see that the dominant one has a field pattern as shown on the screen. Those again familiar with the rectangular waveguide know this as the TE10 mode and we can scroll through each of the higher order modes and see what field pattern we should expect of those. Now it's probably time to talk about integration lines and you see here that the field lines extend from the bottom to the top of the rectangular waveguide, but there's nothing inherently special about the bottom or the top of this waveguide. This is an absolutely symmetric object and there's absolutely no difference in boundary condition that dictates that this field line pattern should point from bottom to top. In fact, when the solver is not given any integration line or means of calibrating that particular polarity of a mode, it will arbitrarily assign a direction for those particular modes. So to handle this, assuming that we want to actually calibrate the direction of these modes, we would use a line of integration. So I already have a project defined in which I've created a line of integration. And we could see that by selecting the excitation. You'll see here that I've drawn a line of integration such that the field line patterns is specified to point from top to bottom rather than bottom to top. And if we look at the port definition, you'll see where I define that integration line. Now, if we look at the field line pattern, we'll see that that first mode now points from top to bottom. And this is one of the primary uses of that integration line that we've sort of glazed over until now. Now heading back to our other project, we could actually also look at some field patterns as we did before. So here I'm plotting the electric field magnitude across the whole volume of that waveguide. 
Now you probably have two questions. One is which mode am I actually exciting? And the other is what frequency do these fields apply to? Now if you look at my setup, you'll see that I've meshed this project at four gigahertz. So the field, the field patterns actually correspond to four gigahertz. And remember, when we look at this plot, we know that at four gigahertz, this dominant mode should be propagating. And you could see that it actually is propagating from the electric magnetic field plot. Now to answer that second question, let's take a look at the sources for our field overlays. So right-clicking field overlays and selecting edit sources, we can see here which mode at which port we're exciting. Here we're shown at port one, mode one, we're exciting with one watt. So let's change that to zero and instead excite the second mode and hit apply. And now this looks interesting. We see here an E field magnitude that seems to correlate to an evanescent mode or one that doesn't actually exit the source. It dwells around the source and doesn't fully propagate through the structure. And that shouldn't be a surprise because if we look at our propagation constant plot, we see that the second mode and everything thereafter aren't really propagating through our structure because we're actually below the cutoff frequency. Now, if you recall, I'm solving this project at four gigahertz. So these field patterns correlate with a four gigahertz excitation. So again, we're below the cutoff frequencies of those modes. Should we, so we should not expect a E field magnitude that looks as mode one did. And if we wanted to, we could step through all of these sources and take a look at the third mode, for example, and we should see a very similar result and that the field magnitudes don't seem to propagate through the structure. So hopefully this gives you a better understanding of exactly some of the problems we use a driven modal solution for. For example, if I were say looking at a coaxial transition to a waveguide, I might wanna look at the insertion loss between say a TEM coax mode and a wave, another waveguide mode on the other end. So there are a lot of different things we can do with a driven modal solution that a driven terminal really can't do. We'll actually end up using some of these tools, such as plotting of the propagation constant later in this series, so stay tuned.